and you're watching FRCD on CAN TV. Family Resource Center on Disabilities is the Region 1 Parent Training and Information Center in Illinois. You can reach us at 312-939-3513. You can visit our website at www.frcd.org. We also encourage you to follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter at FRCDPTI, and on YouTube at FRCD1231. Family Resource Center on Disabilities is not a law firm or a legal service agency. Hi, my name is Paula Wills, and you're watching FRCD on CAN TV, where we discuss special education, parent advocacy, and resources for families of children with disabilities. And I'm happy to be back because today we're going to be talking about the components of the IEP. For those of you who don't know, an IEP or Individualized Education Program is a document designed for children with disabilities to receive their free appropriate public education. And in this document houses the student's goals, uh, their current status, and current status of their disability and um, where they, where they uh, reside um, presently as far as their schoolwork is concerned. And their IEP also includes where do we see them going and what more important, most importantly, what services do we need to help get them there? This document is a legal binding document. So it is very important for parents to understand what's in this document, how it affects their child, and when to contact the school if you feel like there is a discrepancy with this document. That being said, we often tell parents at Family Resource Center on Disabilities that make sure you read the IEP, even if you don't understand what's in it, even if it doesn't make an iota of sense, one of the main things you want to do is at least go through it. And then once you've read it once and it still doesn't make sense, just give us a call. Because what we do, aside from providing training on special education services in Illinois, is we will sit down and go through your child's IEP with you. So if you have questions or you're receiving pushback from the school or you're not understanding um, exactly how these services are are working, or maybe you don't feel like your child needs an IEP at all, you can give us a call and we'll go through um, that IEP with you and understand and help you understand uh, what your rights are as a parent and your child's rights are as a student. So that being said, today our focus is going to be on the main components of the IEP. Now one of the first things you do uh, one of the first things you're going to want to do uh, when you get your child's IEP, sometimes they might give you a draft, sometimes you might see it for the first time in the IEP meeting. Either way, you want to make sure that your child, that the IEP is for your child. Does the IEP have your child's name on it? It doesn't happen often, but occasionally they may have the wrong child. So you kind of want to skim through it at the very least, make sure that the information is correct. Is the address correct? Um, often on that first page, you're going to find, you'll be asked to sign that first uh, page. You'll see a list of everyone who's there uh, at that meeting. And it'll also list what your child's disability is, as well as uh, their school, their name, age, and grade. So those are just some, those are some of the basic things that you're going to see on the first page. Now, once you have, you know, clarified that, you know, you okay, that's all correct. We're going to get into the next portion of the IEP, which is called um, the present level of performance. Now, the present level of performance is going to give you a snapshot of who your child is today. So, uh, if there's been interventions that were in place, they're going to tell you if there, if your child, you know, has there been any um, improvement? What is your child doing today? Or what grade level are they operating at? You know, where are they struggling? So you're going to get a clear understanding of where your child is operating 
on this first day uh, uh, on the today in this meeting. So when you're looking at it, you know, make sure that sounds like your child. Is this, you know, um, if you know your child's struggling in a particular subject and they say that you're doing, their child is doing fine in that subject, but you know for a fact your child's not doing well, you see them struggling at night, every day when they come home trying to do the homework, um, you know, this is a, you, you definitely want to make note of that. The other thing, or it could be the opposite. Maybe they're saying your child has not made improvement in a particular area and you've seen, you know, you've seen that they've gone well past that goal. Not only have they mastered it, but they're you're doing other things. So at the very least, you want to look at that present level and see if you agree with, you know, what your, where your child is presently. And sometimes you won't have time to necessarily do all of this at the IEP meeting. But once you get that IEP, that's something you're going to want to read through and see if you agree with. So the next thing, uh, another uh, important component of the IEP are the annual goals. So now that you've looked at where your child is operating presently, and they're in there you would have seen their strengths, their weaknesses, the next thing you're going to want to look at is how are we going to strengthen those weaknesses? You know, how are we going to bridge those gaps? What types of goals are, what are we working on now to get your child to grade level, if that is the issue? So one of the things, one of the things with the goals is the, you want to make sure when you're looking at the goals, you're going to look at to see what those goals are, first of all. Then you're going to want to look to see, are those goals measurable? So let's say sight words. That's a common example we like to use. Let's say your, ch your child uh, is struggling with sight words, reading, um, things of that nature. And they say, okay, we're, your child is going to read 50 sight words. All right. So in those goals, it would be inappropriate if they said your child is going to learn more sight words. That's not measurable. What will be appropriate is if they, uh, the st they say that your, so your child may learn 10 new sight words or 50 new sight words. And in there, it'll list the goals, the benchmarks, uh, where, she, you know, um, and what we'll possibly be doing to help get the student to that next goal. So to reach that goal. So as a parent, this is something you're going to want to pay a close attention to, because when you're looking at goals, these, you know, in order for these goals to happen, they can't, just, they're not just going to happen by writing them down. The question is, how is your child going to get to these, to get to the point where they can reach these goals? What is preventing them from reaching that goal? Why are they struggling with the sight words? Is there, what type of interventions need to be made to help them reach that goal? Is it a, is it a visual issue? Is it an issue of them sh focusing on uh, struggling to pay attention? Um, could, it, could it be other comprehension issues? So there's a, there's a number of things that um, needs to be understood as to why the student may not be able to reach that goal. So that brings us to related services, supplementary aids and services. So in order for the student to reach the goals, they're going to need interventions and supports. That's part of the reason what that's part of the reason for the IEP. Because in order for the student is entitled to a free appropriate public education. So often we're looking at where are they operating in relation to the general, their general peers. So what is preventing them to getting, preventing them from getting to where their general peers are. And so often in the IEP, there are additional services and uh, aids that are and modifications and accommodations that are made to help the student, to help bridge that gap to help that student um, access the general curriculum and get as close as possible to 
operating in, uh, as close to their general peers as possible. But, you know, sometimes, you know, the student may never, depending on the student's disability, um, the student may not necessarily get there, but we want to get as close as possible. So we go back to related services. So what, so we're looking at like types of services and support. Like does, does the student need speech, uh, speech support? Does, a, does the stu student need a paraprofessional? Does the student need a dedicated aid? Um, I can't necessarily give you a, 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 a complete answer because it really depends on the student. So these are, but basically the related services are going to be a service or um, a service or tool that's going to help that student reach that goal to help them access the general curriculum. So, and that will, that will be listed under um, related services and supp supplementary aids and services. Yes, related services and supplementary aids. So when you're looking at these goals, often we get, I said when you're looking at the goals, one of the questions that should always be in the back of your mind is how are we going to get there? Because it's one thing to, you know, it's a great thing to have high expectations. We always, you know, um, encourage families and parents to have high expectations. However, how are we going to get to the goal? Okay, because once you, it's great, we have the expectations, we have a goal. Now, how are we going to get the student there? So, if the goal, the services need to match the goal. So, if, um, so if sight words or um, a particular skill is preventing the student from accessing the general curriculum, act, you know, uh, meeting their goal, then one of the things that uh, needs to determine is what type of service does the student need? Does the student need an aid? Does the student, um, you know, is, is, it, is the uh, methodology appropriate? You know, um, maybe it might be a different, it might be a different type of uh, learning system that they may need. And, you know, that the teacher may have to administer, or I would say either the special education teacher or, or depending on where they, where the, uh, where their placement is. But in any event, whatever that student needs to reach that goal, um, it needs to, you know, it all needs to be in alignment. You can't have a student, you can't say a student is going to reach uh, 50 sight words and they're currently at 10 sight words. And the only supplement that you may be providing is after school tutoring. Now that may be enough, but depending on the student's disability, uh, they may need more intervention than that. They may need more support than that. So that's why you want to make sure um, that the that the services um, are are appropriate. And sometimes you don't know. You know, you get the IEP, um, and they might say ten minutes of speech. That might be appropriate. It may not. You have to give it. You know, you have to give it. You know, some time to see if this is actually going to work. But if it's not working, um, then you need to sit down with the IEP team and say, look, you know, we're not, we're not reaching this goal or, or my student ha or the student has surpassed their goal. That's another thing. Like sometimes in, with goals, the student may reach that goal in two weeks. So we need to revisit the IEP. But in the case of supplemental, uh, in terms of having supplemental aids, and uh, related services, um, we want to make sure that we at uh, that uh, we want to make sure that the student has access, you know, has access and appropriate services. Another uh, service that we mention a lot that we don't, uh, I, I didn't mention, is uh, transportation. That also falls under related service. Um, I bring that up because we def we get a lot of calls about that. Um, at the center. And so 
Uh, I just wanted to also let families know that transportation is included in related services because a student does need to does need to get to school, especially if the student has been placed in the school that's outside of, um, I would say outside of maybe their district or, uh, you know, where I guess where it may you know necessarily be difficult for them to get to. It, it really, it does depend. So we've talked about, um, we've talked so far about the present level of performance. Uh, we've talked about annual goals. Um, we've talked about, and one thing that I actually skipped over, um, actually, no, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't skip over at all. Um, we talked about related services. Now we're going to talk about least restrictive environment because I did mention placement. So in special education, when we talk about placement, we're talking about where the student is going to receive their services. And often, we, in, in any case, we want to, the student to be in the least restrictive environment, which is um, Basically, the IEP must include an explanation of the extent to any to which the child will not, not participate with non-disabled children in the regular class and extracurricular um, classes and other non-academic activities. So, as much as possible, we want students educated alongside their non-disabled peers, but that's not always appropriate. So we fall under least restrictive environment. So just to kind of let you under, to help you understand the hierarchy of how that works. At the top of this pyramid is the general education. These are non-disabled peers, a clay. So that's at the top of the pyramid. And then we look, then we move into a more restrictive uh, situation where the student is in a non, a, a general education classroom and services are brought into that classroom. So it might, you know, it may be an aid, it be it could be a number of things, but those services are brought into the classroom. Then we move down to a little bit more restriction where maybe the student is pulled out for a portion of the day for that for um that class for those classes. So the student may go to a resource room to receive services. Then um, we get a little more restricted. The student might be in a in a classroom that's uh, where there where there most of their students. I would say the, all the students are disabled, and that uh, will be more that will be more restricted. Um, if we move down uh, to more restriction there, then the student that would look like a student who's in a school where all the st the students in the school are disabled. Then we move to then the next level of restriction would be that the student um, the student would be attending let's say the student uh, may be receiving services at a hospital where they're living at a facility and the services are um, there it could be um, it could be like a form of a hospital or something like that and then uh, most restrictive are homebound services where the student is educated at home. Uh, due to their disability. So um, when we're talking about least restrictive environment, that's what we're talking about. As much as possible, we want students with their non-disabled peers. So they, you know, it could be like part of their classes are, you know, maybe in a special education uh, classroom, but maybe part of the day for certain subjects where the student can uh, work with non-disabled peers, um, they might spend, you know, a class or a session there. So that being said, once it's the but it's determined by the services and what the student needs. So um, we often say special education is not a place; it is a series of services, and it comes down to what's appropriate. You know, where is it appropriate for the student to receive these services? So that's another component that you're going to want to look at: is where are the students? Where is your student receiving their services? Sometimes. For that initial IEP, they may assign the student a school. Sometimes it's in their neighborhood. 
Sometimes it might be outside their, you know, their community. Um, sometimes, depending on the student's needs, the student might be tuitioned out to another, um, to a to a private school. It really depends, because this does. I would say that. Well, I wouldn't say it. This is this is the case. The district, the school district, has to provide the student FAPE a free appropriate public education. So if that school district or that school cannot provide the, the uh, student the appropriate services that they need, to, then, they, then the district has to send the student to a school that can't. Now, oftentimes a school will bring in services for the student, but if it's not uh, possible, the student cannot meet the needs of the student, then the, stu the school district will send that student to another uh, setting that's more appropriate. So that is something that you also want to make you know, sure of, because we do get phone calls at Family Resource Center on Disabilities where parents are a little confused as to why this they're, they're moving their kid or their child from the school that they're at to another school saying that we cannot serve their child there. So depending on how you feel about it, for some families, they would prefer that their child leave their, their current um, home school because they also, they agree that their student is not receiving what they need. Some families feel differently. They feel that they want their child um, in their district, their neighborhood school. It might be because they have siblings there. It could be a number of reasons, but Ultimately, when we're talking about least restrictive environment and we're talking about placement, that's what we're talking about. So, um, once we get past least restrictive environment, uh, we need to talk about assessments. So, assessments is, is really just measuring where your student is. Um, uh, not so much with present level, but just measuring where they are academically, you know, um, and this is a and this there there are a couple of assessments. There's the assessment that happens annually, um, where pretty much all students are assessed, and then there's also the evaluation. Now we're not necessarily talking about the evaluation. Sometimes I believe it's called the MAP. Um, you will see on your child's IEP. So those assessments you will that will also come up as to where your how your child scored um, on those uh, state assessments. Um, in addition, if there was a particular, if there was an evaluation done, that will also be included in there. Um, but I should point out evaluations, uh, once you've had your initial evaluation, they happen every three years unless something has changed and you want your child reevaluated. So another um, section that we talk about are details of services. So we've talked about placement, we've talked about supplementary, uh, um, I'm sorry, related services. But when we're talking about details of services, um, we want to know how are those services going to be delivered? You know, aside, you know, in addition to where, you know, how are they going to be delivered? Like how many minutes? Uh, what is the repetition? You know, you know how, how many times a week? Um, just a number of things that come along with, um, you know, when, when do these services start? You know, uh, if, is there an end date? Is there, will there be modifications? You know, so when we're looking at like, for example, let's say, you know, your student is, t is um, taking history. Now they might have some significant reading uh, comprehension, um, reading comprehension, uh, Issues. So what? What? So when a student is taking history, they're not necessarily trying to teach the student reading. They're trying to teach the student history. So they might modify their their, their curriculum. So where a, let's say the student is in a freshman in high school and they're expected to write a ten-page paper on Benjamin Franklin. You know, the, if if you have a student who's maybe severe or profound who is also at that same age group, they might have that student um, maybe either, depending on how what their level is, it might have them draw a picture of Benjamin Franklin, or they might have uh, them answer some questions about Benjamin Franklin depend, uh, based off of maybe a story that was read to them. 
So it really depends on, uh, you know, again, where your student is operating at that, you know, at that level. And again, I should also point out everything that I'm saying here, everything I'm saying here is in individualized. So one student's IEP is not going to look like the other student's IEP. Everybody's different, and that's why you can't necessarily come out and uh, have a blanket plan for every everybody other than, you know, the student qualifies for an IEP. So, but in terms of details of services, all of that's going to be in there. So, um, the last one I just wanted to mention is transition planning. Transition planning, uh, this doesn't start to the students 14 and a half. So if, you're, if your child is like a freshman, that's when transition will come up. But for the most part, um, it's, it doesn't necessarily come up. You know, you won't have to deal with that for a while. So I hope this has been helpful in, help, in understanding the various components of the IEP or the individualized education program. If you have any questions about anything I discussed today, you can contact Family Resource Center on Disabilities at 312-939-3513. And with all that being said, thank you everyone for joining me today, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you.